Good morning, Prime Minister. I'm happy to be able to honor you a venue here in the city of Brussels. Well, uh, four years ago, uh, we hosted you in uh, Rome, at NatCon Rome, in, in 2020, just, just a week before coronavirus. Uh, at the time, you were being uh, conducting a conversation with my close friend and colleague, Chris, Chris DeMuth, who couldn't uh, make it uh, to this conference and sends his regards. But I remember, ver I remember very well uh, that uh, at the time, four years ago, Chris asked you, he said, look, the national conservative movement, uh, it, it, it's lacking in powerful leadership, and uh, perhaps it's Hungary's time to, to take the leadership, to be an example to, to, to this movement in many other countries. And I remember very well uh, that you said, look, Hungary is a small country uh, at the edge of Europe, and uh, leadership in such a big enterprise will have to come from France or Britain or from Italy, from some major country. In the meantime, it seems as though Hungary has actually stepped forward. Uh, there are uh, mag magazines and conferences and, and, uh, uh, and think tanks sprouting up both in Hungary and elsewhere. And you've been supporting it. It's, it's actually very unusual for a, for a conservative prime minister to take an interest in these things. Has something changed? In many senses, yes, it uh, has changed. But uh, the answer I have given at that time is still valid. So I, I think that if you are speaking about the conservative political movement, need the proper size country to lead it, politically speaking. Uh, and happily enough, now we have some chances. Italians, the highly reputed prime minister, so they should lead politically. French are in good shape. Marie Le Pen is just on the way back or, or up to the sky. Uh, so France probably should lead politically that kind of pan European. But the other side, is uh, uh, because um, Hungary is far more active now in the international world. and there are three reasons for that. First is that uh, using the pandemic as, a, as an occasion, uh, the bureaucrats in Brussels tried something. Probably not many of you followed that, but uh, they created a new financial system, which is um, a perfect uh, instrument to blackmail countries who do not behave well on ideological sense. And therefore, countries like Hungary and Poland before were literally blackmailed financially to give up our policy on migration, on gender, uh, on traditional values and so on. Th that's a huge change. So that's, it, it's, a, it's, it's an attempt to suffocate Hungary and Poland previous financially. So we have to react on that. If you are attacked internationally that high level, you have to be more active. That's one of the reasons why Hungary is more active internationally than we were previously. The second is that something bad is going on here in, uh, in Brussels and in the European Union. Uh, during the, during the, the leadership of Ursula von der Leyen, the whole political commission became more and more politicized. And they started to behave not as guardian of the treaty, but as a political actor. And you know, that brings the European Union at the verge of uh, freedom and oppression, like the yesterday's story exactly exemplified where we are. So we have to fight for freedom more in Europe. So that's make, make, make us more active. And the third one is, that there are some news from Western countries of an everyday suppression. That if, if, if a normal worker in his working location just make a remark about anti-migration, anti-gender, against the war, he can lose very easily his job. It's not a high level discussion, it's an everyday, you know, we use the term everyday fascism, everyday communism, it's an everyday oppression. 
which is growing in many countries of European Union. So those who, who fight for freedom or fought for freedom as we did, you know, we have to be active again. Um, uh, so wh what was our, de our decision? This is the case. We should uh, create a kind of conservative civic society for all the conservatives who would like to fight for freedom. And Hungary is a, is a proper place for that. Because very difficult to define what's going on in Hungary, you know. Leftists try to do it in a very outline what the hell is going on in Hungary, but we can say one thing clearly that if Europe today, it's a kind of progressive liberal ocean. And that is an island, a country which does differently. So Hungary is the island of difference at this moment in Europe, which is a proper uh, place for the conservatives to come, speak freely, to discuss and probably plan some common political action for the future. So this is the change. So self-defense, danger of democracy, danger of freedom, uh, and a good example of Hungary, which can be helpful to create a kind of conservative civic society, if it is intellectually not too controversial. All right, very good. So we are, at this point, <clears throat> less than two months away from uh, from European elections, from elections to the uh, European Parliament. And uh, uh, we're just recently got to see, a, you could almost say, a change in regime in Poland, which I think has many people wor worried. Could you tell us how you see this uh, election campaign in which you're, you are deeply involved? What are the key issues that uh, conservatives and nationalists should be uh, looking out for in this political campaign? What is at stake? What are the key issues? Okay, first, first let us clarify the job. Uh, so I'm a doer. Uh, I'm not the man to provide intellectual ideas. That's your job, probably. Uh, so my job is just to do the political decisions. And if I approach this question of the election from that point, uh, the sense of this European election is uh, change the leadership. What is election for? The sense of election is that if the leadership proves to be bad, must be replaced. That's so simple. And this leadership of European Union is bad. It's failed. So, so it's, it's, it's not just a political statement. It's very much factual. So if, okay, it's a leadership as, as in every country. They selected certain issues in the last five years. And they promised that they will manage that issues. That, let's say, green transition. Green transition is failed, uh, not properly engineered, so they have to recalculate again. Agriculture, they promised a better agriculture, and now the farmer community is suffering all around Europe. They said competitiveness will be improved in these five years. The competitiveness of Europe is declining. Uh, they said that they will stop and manage somehow the migration crisis. Migration crisis is bigger than earlier. Then they said, that they will introduce some sanctions, sanctions to stop the war, Ukrainian-Russian war. The war is going on. So if the leadership promising something, let's say five or six important points for the community, and fail to deliver, they have to leave. Go away. We need new leadership. That's the sense of election policy. Uh, intellectually, it's a different issue. It's more complicated to find more conservative approach to the European institution and to find leaders who behave more, who, who, who deliver more respect to the national governments and to the nations of Europe. Don't neglect them as it was done in the last five years. Hello, hello. If uh, I've been assigned the job of the, uh, the intellectual here in this conversation, uh, so let me ask you an intellectual question. We have, uh, I hope it's not too intellectual. We have, um, a debate among uh, political theorists and scholars about what the best way to, to describe uh, this new movement on the right is. And uh, as you know, I think it's best described as nationalism, uh, the, the, the defense of the idea of the, the independent national state. But there are, are, are many scholars and many journalists and even uh, people who are active in our movement who prefer to use the word populism. I was wondering, what is, what is your view of the use of the term populism? I, th I, th I think that you avoid it. Why? First, may I have a remark on nationalism? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, that, in our language, 
in our culture, nationalism uh, has a positive, a positive meaning. But in West, it's not the case. Because in the West, and especially in Germany, they have an understanding of their political history that all the, all the major crimes and bad things, uh, catastrophe in their history was created by national level. And the international level was the solution. Look at like Nazis, yeah? Uh, in Central Europe, it's just the opposite. In our history, all problem was created by international communities, and the good answer was national reply, you know? So therefore, <laughs> therefore, in our mind, nationalism is a solution, is a good answer, and a kind of good resistance against the empires in uh, order to save your sovereignty, independence, and so on. So, but, but at the same time, the international arena, especially because of the overwhelming uh, impact of liberal press, if you say nationalism, you are dead man. Because nationalism, uh, liberal interpretation is the neighbor of fascism and feudalism, so, so awful things. Uh, so therefore we created uh, a kind of um, uh, replacement of national patriotism and all that kind, which is intellectually crazy anyway. So the, the proper definition is, 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 is national. Uh, okay, uh, on populism, um, I'm an old man, an old fox in the job, uh, and I remember how was the intellectual level of the political discussions, let's say, 30 years ago. Having discussion with Helmut Kohl, Dakshi, even Tony Blair, you know. So the, so, the, so, so the intellectual content, substance of the political discussions 20, 30 years ago was, was, was not, not like today. You know. Today, everything is about a kind of fight of language. It does not matter what is the substance, because it has a political meaning of certain categories, and, and you are bombed, you know, you are bombed. Uh, and populism is that kind of negative uh, stigma, which they use against you if, you don't, if the liberals don't like you. But if we try to be serious, what is populism about? Because originally, it has a sense. It was not as... Uh, publicly used as today. Populism was a well-known category saying that there are candidates for leadership who promising nice and good things, being aware that if they are in power, they will not be able to fulfill that. They will not be able to deliver. That was populism. But to, to be accused as a Hungarian prime minister is ridiculous. Because I promise popular things and I believe it all. That's not populism, that's politics, you know. So, for public security, I promised public security because that was a mess, not as a public security. I promised that one million more jobs will be created. It's done. I said that we will defend the families against gender propaganda. We did. Uh, we promised that we will stop the migration. We stopped, and so on and so on. It's not populism, it's politics. It's leadership, what we are doing. <coughs> As a young man, you lived under communism, and I, I, th I think you heard, I, I heard you mention that uh, some of the things that we're seeing now are uh, re remind you a little bit of uh, uh, of communism. Is uh, if you think about this seriously, is it, it is it true? We thought we defeated defeated the Marxists uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Do you think it's coming back? Is there something to that? Uh, okay. How was the end of the communism? That was one of the nicest periods of my life. <laughs> to push down the communists and uh, push the Soviet Union out of the country, that was, uh, that was really uh, a joy. Um, uh, how did it happen? So, like just yesterday here, we, stop, we established Fidesz in 88 as an anti-communist uh, young political organization. And we started to organize meetings. And, you know, it was in the second part of the 80s, 88, so it was obvious that it's not as a harsh dictatorship as it was earlier. So some, some movement has a chance to survive, not that we were not imprisoned and so on, but they did everything not to happen, the free expression of, of our opinion. So we rented a place in Budapest, uh, 
and just several hours prior to the meeting, it was said that unfortunately it's not available anymore. And then, and then we looked for another one, and they said that if 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 the runner the runner of the place would supply us with some beer and some food, he will be out of the business, you know. So so the same kind of pressure technologies which you have experienced here was very common in the second part of the 80s in Hungary. But finally, we, we won. Uh, so, so I think um, um, the, the problem is probably intellectually, Professor, that, that uh, political leaders discussing too much on political systems, democracy, authoritarian, mix, and blah, blah, blah. But the main question is freedom. Whatever you characterize a political system, the question is oppression versus freedom. And I think freedom in Europe, and especially in Brussels, is in danger. As just yesterday, it was uh, shown. So, whether you, call it, whether you call it communism or not, we are living in the verge of freedom and oppression in, in, in Europe, in the Western civilization. And we have to fight for the freedom. So that's, that's what I can say, that uh, those who love freedom, must be united and fought against the forces of oppression, ideologically, politically, the legal system, and so on and so on. So freedom is a serious fight now in Europe again. Is, is this election an election about oppression? Or is that an exaggeration? No, it's an exaggeration in a sense because the, because the elections will happen at national level. And the, and the nations are in different uh, shapes. So in some countries, it's about freedom as well. But in other countries, it's not. So, because we are different. Let's, um, let's move to some of, some of these uh, larger issues. I think we, we can't have a conversation about politics uh, in Europe today without talking about immigration. Yeah. And uh, I, I think everybody would benefit from hearing, hearing your views. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you read the media as well as everybody else does. And uh, uh, there's a tendency to accuse you xenophobic of uh, hatred of foreigners. That's, you know, obviously Hungary has no foreigners because you, you hate them. W what's your actual view of, um, of immigration? Okay. First, just to clarify the position of Hungary on migration. It's true that the number of migrants in Hungary is zero. Uh, and the reason is very simple. The reason is very simple. We have a system which is a fair system. We say that the border is a border. And to cross the border illegally, it's an illegal action. So we can't accept that somebody illegally crossing the border line. You know, it's a crime. It's not a human right something. It's a crime. So therefore, we, we treat everybody who is doing that as a crime. That's the first. The second is, the second is, we understand that many people would like to come, uh, let's say, in Hungary. But there is a procedure of that. If you would like to come to Hungary, first you have to pass your, uh, your request uh, to the Hungarian authorities, let's say in an embassy, let's say in Belgrade, which is the neighboring country capital, and then stay and wait. So nobody can step into the territory of Hungary prior to get the final decision of the Hungarian authorities whether you let you come in or you can't. So you have to wait outside. This is the key issue. And, and, and this is the red line. If you are not able to manage that all around Europe, all national uh, authorities, to manage the same regulation, that those who would like to come to Europe must stay out and waiting for the answer of the authorities to their request, they can't move earlier than that. So if you are able to manage that, migration is over immediately. This is the solution. That was done by us. In 2016, we created the fence, the border guards, and that kind of legal regulation. Okay, now let's say something about more philosophically on migration. Because migration now is about civilizations as well. Because whether we say or not, the fact is that we have a Christian tradition continent. It's difficult to say whether we are Christian still or not, but it's, it's, a, it's a civilization based on Christian roots and traditions. And those who are coming, they are not. They are coming from the Muslim civilization. Okay, uh, so that's raised plenty of complicated questions. 
And I'm, as I mentioned, it's not my job to answer to that, it's your job. Uh, but, but there is one, one horizon of that question which probably belongs to the, to the doers. And that's lead us to the core, to the heart of conservative thinking. Uh, many definitions exist also, but as a doer I use conservatism, uh, uh, the leaders or the persons or the way of thinking of whom time horizon is, is high or long. So I have some grandkids. Um, by calculation, reasonable calculation, in 2100 they will live. So as a grandfather, I am very much interested in the question, what kind of country Hungary will look like in 2100? And I feel some responsibility not to do something which will be bad for the grandkids, not now, but in 2010, or to do everything now which could be helpful to have a good life for them. Yeah? So migration has that kind of historical horizon. What kind of civilization Europe will look like? It will be a Muslim civilization, a Christian one, or a mix something, or what kind of life it, it, it will look like? And I, what I can say that to live in a Christian society, even if you know, it's not as strong as it was, but to live in a Christian society is an amazing thing. The best thing I can imagine to my kids and my grandkids. So why we should give it up? Just in a way to let uh, different kind of people to change the cultural character of this, of this continent. I have nothing against the Muslims. Islam is a great civilization. If you go there, I just was one week ago in Morocco. You know, that's fantastic. What they have done, not having barbarism, but creating a civilization, is a big thing, you know, in the general circumstances where they live. So they created culture, what's it? It's nice there, but don't bring it into and to change if, if the majority of the society on a democratic basis don't like it. Because I think that nations have the right to decide about their own future. So if somebody would like to, to make an, an attempt to create a mixed society, Christian based with Muslim communities, and as liberal as things, the outcome will be something good. Let's do it. It's your faith, it's your future but don't force us to do so. So that's what we call the, uh, the offer of tolerance, what I have made several times to Brussels. I, I, I said, guys, you can create whatever migration system you would like to do, but don't force Hungary to do the same thing, because we simply don't believe. We think that mixture of the two civilizations will be not resulted in good things. Public security is gone away, the intellectual horizon is totally confused, the value system of societies will be not uh, strong enough to help us to live in a, in a good way. So, so don't force us to do that. And we organized in Hungary a referendum. So what I'm speaking about is not my personal opinion only. It's not interesting anyway. But the Hungarian society, the only one in Europe, who got a chance to express his own opinion in a referendum, they voted against that. They said that we have to defend the border, we would not like to have a mixed civilization, we would like to control the border crossings, we would like to maintain the Christian traditions of our society, so, so we have a, a public decision of our community, how we would like to organize our life. Probably we are not right. But, but who can say that we are not right? It, it's our decision. We took the consequences. That's the way. Let us do our lives on a national basis, as, as, we, as we wish so. So that's our position on migration. It's not just about migration. It's about public order, civilization, and the sovereignty of the nations to decide how they would like to react on this modern phenomena of, of, of mass migration. That's the Hungarian position. So, sorry to be too long, but it's a complicated issue. Is that an appropriate policy or philosophy for all of Europe? I don't think so. My position was always very simple. Don't create public, so sorry, common uh, asylum policy. Uh, we have the Genève Convention about uh, the, the, uh, the asylum system, which is accepted not just in Europe, but everywhere in the world. That's good and that's enough. We don't need common migration policy of European Union. This issue belongs to the nations. That's my point. It's not very much popular because some countries who already let millions of, uh, of uh, migrants to come to their countries, 
they would like to get rid of them, to be, to, to be very clear. And the way to get rid of them, to distribute them to those where they don't have. Right? It's not fair. So do your job on your national basis. Defend your nation. If you need help, Hungary is ready to help. But it's your nation. You can't, you can't hide your interests behind the so-called European refugee system. Come on. It's about the nations who reject the migration. This is the fact. <clears throat> you know, if we're already talking about it, I, I, I simply have to, um, to insert a, a, a note of thanks. Uh, as you know, we, we were moving from one venue to another under, under pressure from leftist politicians. This is our third venue. And we found a, uh, a home here uh, thanks to the, uh, the graciousness of a Tunisian Muslim family that, own, that owns the hall. And I, and I have to say, I, 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 I was with the, uh, the owner in interviews with the media yesterday. And uh, uh, you know, he probably thinks his job is to be a businessman, but you know, he might end up being, being prime minister. He's, he's so eloquent in, in speaking to, you know, he's, he, he says, look, if, if we don't tolerate one another, we're going to set, set the, whole, the whole country on fire. We have to tolerate one another. We have to allow space for one another. It, it was really a, a remarkable performance. I, I, I wanted to thank him. I wanted to give you an opportunity to do so as well. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, uh, so what, what we are speaking about is not a kind of rational character of certain people. This is not the issue, even not with the migration. Uh, because in Hungary also we have uh, um, entrepreneurs coming from Muslim countries doing very well from Turkey and so on. So we have no problem with that, but migration is not an issue. Migration is about the right of a community to decide with whom they would like to live with. That's all. Uh, so thank you very much for the Tunisian friends, and I think it was a good decision le to let you come in, into Belgium. Uh, it's a good decision. <laughs> You, you hesitated when you said Christianity. Is there a role for Christianity in, in, in Europe today? I know that, uh, that Hungary um, is, uh, you know, it, it, many people in the West look to Hungary as an example of a country in which uh, public Christianity uh, is, uh, has been taking steps forward. Uh, but I was surprised to find out when I visited Budapest on one of my visits that uh, that uh, uh, weekly church attendance, attendance in church in Hungary is, you know, something like 10 percent. It's in, in many ways also a post-Christian country. What, what role does Christianity play in your view uh, in the public life of Hungary and of Europe and Western nations more, more generally? So we Hungarians are in trouble uh, because um, the orientation uh, of the people to the eternal questions of the life is diminishing. So we are more living on the, on the everyday level and uh, possibilities and motivation to think in a more um, abstract way about our life, to be born, die, family. So, you know, eternal questions, it's, it's to be discussed. The level of discussion is very much down, not in the public life. And the church is unfortunately not, not strong enough at all, exactly as you have said. But you know, to be Christian was always very difficult, you know, because original meaning Christian, to be Christian means that you, you follow the teaching of Jesus. Uh, and you know, it's very difficult. Uh, even, in the, even in the previous times, but today it's even more difficult because, um, because the temptations are, are far higher and far many than it was earlier. So the temptation not to follow the teaching of Jesus is probably the highest ever in the European uh, history. So very difficult. And I understand that if the churches are not doing better, if the prophets are not coming, you know, if the professors are not speaking on philosophical issues, if the local communities are not ready to open their heart to that question, you know, we, we, will, we will lose Christianity at times. So that's one level of the problem. So we are in a, in a trouble. On the other side, uh, there is another interpretation of Christianity. Not as the teaching of Jesus Christ in your personal life and to follow it, 
but about as a cultural heritage. And on that basis, the state and the public will can do a lot. In Hungary, for example, it is written into the constitution that the public authorities must do everything to maintain the Christian values of our societies. Whatever does it mean? It's a serious discussion. What does it mean exactly? How to do it? But the intention is very clear that we have a tradition which we would like to maintain, and the state has a role to maintain it through their institutions. We can't force the people to, to follow certain religious convictions, but we can insist on that the spiritual content of education or uh, the treatment in the hospital must have some basic values which strongly related to the cultural tradition, the Christian cultural tradition. So we try to do something like that. Uh, strangely enough, when the Hungarian people get less and less religious, they support more and more Christian values. I'm surprised at that anyway, but this is the social phenomenon which is going on. I don't know exactly why, probably because of migration, probably because of the suppression coming from Brussels, liberal ocean of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of uh, occupying everything, but the intention of the people to maintain something they call Christian cultural tradition is very strong, and the level of personal belief is decreasing. That's the dilemma we are living in. We know that Europe is, um, well, like most Western countries, Europe faces a, a demogra demographic crisis. Um, in, in part, the argument for a mass immigration, you know, from the direction of the economists, uh, is 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 looking at the future of a depopulating uh, Europe. Uh, your country is um, uh, is uh, well known, at least in conservative circles, for experimenting with efforts to. Uh, to alter the demographic direction, which is especially necessary if immigration is going to remain uh, remain low. Uh, can you tell us, uh, do you believe in this? What is your experience? Is it, is, is it working or, or or is it just a mirage? May I, may I introduce here my conspiracy theory as well, uh, which is behind the migration. Um, so, the, so the fact is that those who are saying that our continent is aging and nations are aging is true. But each nation has the possibility to find the answer how to react on that. So the answer cannot be a centrally forced migration policy, definitely cannot be. So it's not an answer, not an acceptable way to find an answer, because that belongs to find an answer to each community, which means each nation, each country, individually. So what Hungarians are doing, we, uh, uh, so we, we try to support families first. We spend huge amount of money in a very polite and moderate way to convince the young generation that family is a good thing. Uh, it's very complicated anyway because it's, it could easily become a issue uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, not proper distinction between those who would like to have kids and those who would not would like to get. So it's, it's a complicated uh, issue. But in Hungary, find a way in the last 10 years to build up a strong family supporting system, financially and legally as well. So that's first. Um, second, of course in Hungary, it's obvious that we we lacking of workers every year around, but this year it is, uh, is 65,000. So every year, the economic ministry publish, uh, publishes a figure saying that this year has no Hungarian uh, people to work at 65, 30, well, certain number of, uh, of jobs. And we allow guest workers to have that job, only that job and only guest workers. And we copied the Qatari's regulation, basically, anyway, to be a little modernized, but it's a Qatari, uh, Qatari's uh, regulation. Guest workers can stay two plus one year, two plus one year, and then they have to leave. It's over. If they would like to come back, they have a chance to come back one more, another three years. Then they have to leave again. So they don't have the right to stay. We have to have that interruption because the crazy, stupid European regulation says that if they stay continuously for a period, can't push them out. But get because most leave is to stay, we don't need you more. 
anymore. So this is a right of the, of the nation to say it. Because we provide not a home, we provide a job possibility. That's the deal. It's a, it's a contract. So I think it's fair. So what, that, that's how we're doing that. But in long term, no any other solution, only to raise the number of the kids who are born. 2.1% is the, is, is the rate we have to reach. And now in Hungary, we have 1.58, 1.6. But we started from 1.2. So the tendency is positive, but it's very difficult to raise. Because simply, the young generation would not like to get more kids, which is a problem leading us against the Christianity and related uh, questions, spiritual life. So that's where we are living at me. We hope that if we are able to continue for another 10 years, the pro-family policy, we can reach again 2.1 without, without uh, migration. So that's what we are doing. Okay, let me change the direction just a little bit. We, um... Sorry, conspiracy sure. theory. Oh, the conspiracy. I, I'm sorry. So because, I, 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 I didn't. I, I didn't mean to prevent you from no, 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 no. expressing a conspiracy <laughs> theory. No. Because, because if not, if, if if the real reason why the in many countries the liberal supports migration is not demography, which is my point. It's just pretext. What is the real reason? The real reason that they are collecting voters. That's so simple. If you look at the European history, oh, sorry, the European model, obvious that uh, the political competition was between two major blocks of the political life. Those who remain the old traditional Christian framework, let's like, say Christian democracy conservatives, and the modern guys who left that background, that was the left liberal something. And the, and, and the competition between the two camps resulted in creating governments, correcting each other, you know, changing governments. So it was quite, quite well managed. It was not a bad system. But what was the basis of that? The basis of that, that those who stayed in the Christian tradition is, by and large, are the same as those who left. If the numbers are different, you know, uh, that kind of horizon of the political competition disappears. And what the liberals and the leftists start doing, they recruit voters. They let the Muslim guys come in who will never vote for any Christian country, any Christian party. So now they, they, they are collecting new voters for the left. This is the real explanation. It's not about economy. It's not about democracy. It's just blah, blah, blah. The real reason is power. And because we are living in power, power means number of votes. And they're collecting votes. That's the reality, as I see. Sorry, that's what I call conspiracy theory. But I think it's close to reality. I can't help noticing that um, almost every time somebody uh, in, in the press uh, writes that I'm going to be meeting with uh, Prime Minister Orban of, of Hungary, they always add Prime Minister Orban of Hungary, comma, Putin's closest ally in Europe. I, I, it, it's as, it's as, as though it's your name. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, w w is, th is there any truth in this? Do you regard yourself, does Hungary regard itself as an, as an ally of Putin? No, no, that's, um, ally is a very strong and clear meaning expression. It's not simply, uh, but the question is, uh, what is the relationship between Hungary and Russia, especially under this war which is going on? So it's a serious question. We have a very simple geopolitical strategy, which says that we would not like to have, again, common border with Russia. Because during the Soviet times, Soviet Union and Hungary has a common border. So we would not like to have it again. We respect the rights of Ukraine, uh, sovereignty of Ukraine, people to create their own and maintain their own state. So therefore, invasion of Putin against uh, Ukraine is totally against the values of international relations and all the values we all respect. So no question of that. Uh, but the Hungarian point of, uh, of interest is that 
something must be between Russia and Hungary. So this is the number one. So we support Ukraine to survive somehow, which is a question because Ukraine is not a more sovereign state. Uh, Ukraine is now just protectorate of the West. So without getting the money and the weapons from the European Union and the United States, Ukraine as a state would cease to exist. So it's not, it's not a sovereign state anymore, uh, just to be very clear. But something must exist there anyway. Uh, that's the first point. Second, Hungary has always a, a, a good economic relation with Russia. So I would not like to give up that kind of cooperation because the war between Ukraine and Russia is not the war of the Hungarians. It's a war of two Slavic nations. One big Slavic nations attacked another one. And they have a war. And we don't behave like the Europeans who said, oh, it's our war because it's about values, it's about international order whatsoever, so we are in the war, it's our war, but not fully, because we would not like to die. You know? So please, Ukrainians, die, we give the money, and give the weapon, and defend our values, please. So it's not so much our war to go into, and to take the life we are there to fight there, but just, you know, to finance your, your life. So I don't like that approach at all. But at the same time, it's obvious that each nation, even the Ukrainians, has the right to decide whether they would like to fight and die for their freedom or not. So I don't criticize the Ukrainians why they have a war against Ukraine, because they defend their own, own country or nation. So, so it's their decision. The other question is whether they are doing it cleverly or not. But it's their job to answer, not, not mine. But my, my job as an outsider is only to define and understand what is the reason of the war? And the reason of the war is very simple. It's called NATO membership. And just as a country who was occupied by the Russians for 45 years, I can say on personal experiences that Russians will never uh, allow to have membership of Ukraine as it is now in NATO. For the geopolitical thinking, it's impossible. They will always do everything to have something between the Russian border and NATO countries' border. It could be called Ukraine, it could be war zone, it could be called war, whatever. But a buffer zone must exist between NATO and Ukraine. Probably it's not a legitimate request on behalf of the Russians, because it's outside the territory of Russia. So probably it's illegitimate, but this is the fact. And if you don't answer to the question clearly, whether we would like to encourage Ukraine to join NATO or to say, guys, you have to understand that you are a buffer zone country. You can't change your house number. So be, create a reasonable policy which is adequate to the geographical position. So it's our option. Unfortunately, we, we are not doing to, to, con to deliver evidences that ceasefire and negotiations would be better than continue to war. We're just delivering evidences to the Ukrainians that die more, fight more, and you will win. It's definitely true. They cannot win. Because it's not about the values, it's not about my heart, it's not about my philosophical conviction, it's about reality. So that, that war has no solution on the battleground. What is even more sad? It, it's easy to imagine a situation when the Ukrainians will not get a better peace after losing hundreds of thousands of people than they would have got without having the war. Which raised many, many uh, philosophical and spiritual and moral issues. So I think what we Europeans are doing is bad. It's not targeted on ceasefire and we don't confront it seriously with all the consequences of supporting a country who is in a war which cannot be win. So that's, that, that's a big bulk of the problem and difficulties.